everybody. Uh, my name is Esther van der Voort. I work at the Institute for Environmental Sciences of Leiden University in the Netherlands. Um, and I'm doing this presentation on environmental impacts related to circularity in the facade industry together with my colleague Teun Verhagen who is sitting over here and who will take over in a while. And also with my colleague Linda Hildebrand from Aachen, TU Aachen in Germany. She's not here, but you will see her on screen in a little while. Well, this um, presentation this afternoon is going to be about environmental impacts related to mainly the materials that are used in the facade industry and um, yeah, how a circular economy could help to improve them. And if we talk about circularity, there's always two things ongoing. One is nobody knows exactly what it means. So there are a lot of definitions and a lot of, of different definitions. I once read a paper where it was, I believe, 114 different definitions of circular economy. Um, and I'm not going into that right now because that I can add a 115th definition, but I'm not going to do that. I just want to say that the general idea is in a circular economy, we keep resources that we have extracted from the environment in use for as long as possible. Um, and the first question that we always need to ask whenever we make big changes is, why are we actually doing it? So why do we want to move to a circular economy? To, to what problem is this the solution? Um, then you find generally three reasons. And I will go a little bit into those reasons uh, by and by. First one is supply security. Second one is reduction of waste. And the third one is reduction of environmental impacts. Um, what you see often mentioned as well is that the circular economy is so good because it creates new opportunities for innovation, for jobs, for a new type of growth. Um, that may all be uh, true, but that's, I'm not going into that this afternoon. That's uh, another topic. So first, supply security. Well, the reasoning is, is quite obvious for that. Of course, um, yeah, if we keep resources in use for a longer time, we need less new resources. We need le to extract less from the environment. And that saves, in the end, it saves resources. In a finite, er finite Earth, we can make resources last for a longer time. But we also see that for uh, the majority of resources at the moment, scarcity is not an issue. There's still plenty of it. Um, so, yeah, this, this does not speak very much to the people. Well, we actually have to save resources because otherwise we'll run out of them. Uh, the, the exception to that is the critical materials. So there's a number of, of, of metals and metalloids that are on the list, criticality list. Those have supply issues. And for those having uh, them in use for a longer period of time may actually alleviate those supply problems. For the facade industry, I don't think critical materials are that relevant. But we could see that the list of critical materials may grow in the future. What it does do is, is it leads to a different view on, on mining. The, the, yeah, the linear economy takes those resources out of the mines in the, in the earth, so geological mines, and then processes them, then they're used, and then they're discarded as waste. And then if you want to make new products, you have to go back to the ge geological mines. In that sense, yeah, a circular economy lets us have a look at our society as an urban mine. There's also lots of materials embedded in all kinds of structures, all kinds of products that we can mine after their useful lifespan has ended. 
So you can look at society as a mine. It's, it's really a different type of mine than the geological mines. They're in the ground, you know what to do. For this type of urban mining, we really do not yet know what to do. So there's, we need really different infrastructures, really different uh, logistics, new business models, which was the topic of the talk of yesterday, and also, um, yeah, a new way of, of, of looking at our society. Then the second reason, which is reduction of waste. And this is really where the whole idea of the circular economy started out. Uh, it was Ellen MacArthur sailing the oceans. And she, um, when she did that, she saw all that plastics waste. And she thought to herself, this uh, cannot continue. We have to do something about it. And then she founded her uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and, and which is now quite famous in the area of the circular economy. So plastics in the ocean were, were the first obvious waste problem that um, could be solved by a circular economy. There too, the reasoning is obvious. As long as we keep the materials in use, they are not becoming waste, so we can actually reduce waste considerably by doing that. But then we are talking about final waste, the waste that ends up in landfills or in the, the, as litter in the environment, or uh, maybe at, at incineration plants. Um, but there is still a lot of treatment that needs to be done. It's, it's, there are still discarded products and discarded materials. And then we don't call it waste treatment anymore. We call it repair, we call it refurbishing, remanufacturing, we call it recycling. That are all things that need to happen to the products that, that are discarded. The starting point is again very different. You're not talking about rubbish that you need to get rid of. You're talking about valuable materials that you can reprocess to enter the economy again. That's also yeah, the view of urban mining here, very important. <coughs> and then the third reason to go for a circular economy is that it could reduce environmental impacts. And this is, this is um, yeah, this could be the main benefit of a circular economy. Um, the reasoning here is that, um, well, there, we need a lot of energy to produce materials in the first place. And if we go for secondary materials, for recycled materials, we don't have to do that again. We already did that. Um, the whole processes of, of mining and refining, that has already happened it, for secondary materials. You don't have to do that all over again. So that saves a lot of energy in the production of secondary materials. And um, you can see that clearly back in the, in the examples that we will go into uh, a little uh, later. Um, circular economy is by no means the only solution to reduce environmental impacts related to uh, materials and products. It can also be done by things like uh, substitution, using different materials, or using less materials, just design lighter, or by more efficient production processes, using less energy, altogether reduce uh, the use of, of all kinds of products, or the, the degrowth economy that also could lead to less environmental impacts. And you see that in some of the definitions, all these things are actually included in the concept of the circular economy. Others keep it more narrow. Okay, okay. Um, uh, thanks. And um, um, can I go back? Yeah, this is where I was. So, um, that is uh, actually one of the key messages of today. If you really want to engage into circular economy practices, think about why you would want to do it, because that is important. And that, that is also something that you have to, to uh, keep track of. So does it actually help? Does it reduce waste? Does it uh, reduce scarcity? Does it reduce environmental impacts? Um, now I want to switch to Linda Hildebrand. 
a professor at TU Aachen. She has a contribution that um, is here on the laptop now on environmental impacts related to um, the built environment and specifically um, facades. Let's see, she should be in here somewhere. This one. Hello, everyone. My name is Linda Hildebrand. Can you hear from her? Aachen University. Um, I'm a junior professor for reuse in architecture, and we are focusing on the environmental impact um, of the building industry. And I'm very happy to talk to you today about the environmental performance of facades. And um, as a starting point, um, we see that looking into a different type of media, not only the scientific um, a community, but also in um, yeah, uh, more common media spread out um, through a broad, uh, pr broad readership. We see that the environmental performance of building is increasingly relevant. So people are advertising their, um, their projects by circularity, by carbon neutrality. And it's not only an ethical topic anymore, but it's also becoming increasingly a financial topic. This is also due to the EU, which gives an incentive uh, by the um, ESG uh, categories with the, um, yeah, based on the EU taxonomy. So we see that this is um, from different, from different uh, directions becoming more relevant. And how do these uh, projects start? Um, we need somebody who wants it. So we have a client. Um, we see a couple of projects. It's not the majority yet, but we see an increasingly um, an increasing number. So we have a client that wants to have a special character for his building. And this character is also defined by the environmental performance. So he defines the bar and says, um, I need a a building that's not only beautiful and provides my functions, but it's also um, having a good contribution to the to the environment. Then we have the designers that specify this goal and giving an aesthetics uh, curvature. And then we have the engineers who make it all possible by detailing it and defining the um, defining the different uh, materials and the construction. And then we have the industry. And um, today I hope I speak to a lot of industry partners because I believe that they have a crucial role here. Um, if we, we need products to be integrated um, in, this, uh, in this construction, we need products that have a low, um, low uh, impact on nature. And this can be by low embodied energy or this can be um, because they are designed to be circular and ideally both. So we have different um, different things that we need to consider when we when we look into building products. We have one what we call the input so it is from reuse. This is something that we see is growing in in relevance so that um, products have different life cycles. We also see a growing a growing market for recycling products. And when we put a product today in a building context, we have to design it to be recyclable. So that means that we can take it out and can either uh, reuse it or recycle it uh, in the end. And if you want to um, narrow it down, down, then in the project, it's relevant to consider the emissions, the resources and their life cycle. And we have, of course, um, a big um, catalog of standards that can help us. The um, Dean uh, AN ISO 14040 defines the um, basis uh, to measure the environmental impact. Um, the method for that is the life cycle assessment, a very well, um, a, a tool or a method um, that can do, can assess a different um, aspects, for instance, it could um, assess. You could use it to assess a product or a service. And the interesting part is that you can do that for different stages. So for the production, the usage phase, and um, for 
the transition to the new um, usage, what we call the, the end of life. So we have a basic standard that is um, our framework here and we can put all sorts of products uh, in this or could calculate them against this background. And when we um, look at the data for um, for building products, I have one example here. This is um, glass, which is, of course, very relevant in the facade context. So we look into the different stages of the glass production and ask ourselves, where can we impact the um, environmental performance? Where are the main shares we see that um, for the period of the production, the factory has a big impact. So you see here on the chart, um, the blue part is the resource extraction, the orange one is the transport, and the gray one, the majority one, is at the factory. So um, this is not only true for glass, it's true for a lot of um, uh, materials. So the conditions under which these um, fabrication takes place are very crucial. And these conditions reflect in environmental data. For instance, if we have a renewable energy source, we can decrease the amount of carbon footprint essentially. Also, if we have secondary material, um, so we have recycled content in a profile, this is also very helpful to uh, improve the environmental performance. So um, we have different sources for these environmental data. For instance, we have in Germany um, databases that are accessible um, for free. And we also have the product related um, instruments, which, um, for instance, um, yeah, which relates to a product. Um, um, these are the environmental product declarations, also an instrument that is uh, freely um, accessible. So when we look into these data here, I show you um, the chart shows you environmental impact by primary um, energy, not renewable and also global warming potential for one kilograms um, metal. Um, so we see different products, steel, aluminum here. These are the high bars. We see that um, if we have a recycled content, we can um, reduce the data significantly. So these are the average values from databases. And then we have EPDs, which are not reflected here, but also show a similar trend. So there are two things that we can do to essentially um, improve the environmental performance of building products. We could um, look into the energy source and see that we have a high share of renewable, material, uh, renewable energies here. And then we can um, also um, work with a share of recycled content. Here we also um, have not only the conversation, the conversation uh, of uh, new materials, so we can leave um, we we can leave the resources in the earth. Um, we also have um, an improvement of the environmental performance, which is measured by the global warming potential. And not only the fabrication plays an important role, also the type of facade that we choose. So we have, um, well, a preposition of um, the relation of environmental impact and the facade typology. Here on the chart, you see um, on the x-axis the weight of a facade and on the y-axis you see the environmental impact. So what we want to have is um, we want the facade to be very close to the uh, x-axis. And um, this is a facade study that I did myself, 50 um, facades um, and facade variations um, I looked into. And what, and what I saw is that when we have stick systems with one layer, we have the best environmental performance. If we have two layers, a double facade, then of course we have more materials and the performance, um, the environmental performance is um, a little bit worse. So we have higher values here. And then we have the solid facades um, um, with a, um, yeah, the, the solid facades with pitched uh, windows. So here we have a medium uh, performance of the, um, of the facade. And this typology 
also gives an um, yeah a preposition uh, for the environmental performance. We are at a very interesting time right now, and we see that the number of projects which incorporate circularity and their extent to the environment in the design process, in the construction, and their choice of materials. And um, I'm closing this impulse um, with an insight um, on a project in Australia, which was designed to be carbon neutral. And um, against um, all obstacles, they made it happen that um, yeah, the billets for the um, stick system were produced uh, with a renewable energy source and high recycled content. And it was a marketing question, um, oh, sorry, it was an environmental question um, as part of the marketing uh, concept. So the project had this high goal of carbon neutrality and in the end, who sold the project was the one that um, was the facade company with the uh, um, environmental um, with the best environmental performance and this is um, why I believe that this key this is key um, in future business um, uh, business models that the environmental performance is a unique selling point uh, for facades. Thank you uh, thank you for your time and I wish you a great great uh, workshop and great conference. Sorry, I can't be there. Bye bye. All right. Hello, everyone. Is this one on again? Hildebrand yes, from it is. Aachen University. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm a junior professor for reuse in architecture, and we are focusing on the environment. So this is where we were. Okay, well, you've heard now something about environmental impacts and facades and how you can um, assess that with life cycle assessment. I'm go also going to say a few words on, on life cycle assessment, not going into the methodology in detail, but just a few things that are important to keep in mind if you think about all the alternative options that you can use for your, your facades. So this is the ISO standard that Linda also talked about. This figure that is actually printed in the ISO standard of life cycle assessment. Um, it's three um, uh, consecutive steps. So the goal and scope definition. That's very important that we know exactly what we're talking about. And if you compare things, that those are the identical things. Now we'll go into that a little bit more. Then the inventory analysis, where data are collected about the product or the service. Um, all kinds of data about processes, what goes in them in raw materials and energy, what comes out in, in, um, in materials, in half fabricates, in products, and how does that add up uh, all together to the functional unit that we have. And then this inventory, which also includes the emissions to the environment is then translated into an impact assessment. So all the different emissions are added up to form impact categories like, uh, for example, um, uh, climate change. So all greenhouse gas emissions are translated into a CO2 equivalents and then added up to, um, to a climate change problem. And so for um, a number of other environmental issues as well. Um, You'll see that a little later as well. And then here is the interpretation column that, that really happens all through the whole process. You have always to go back and forth and um, find new data and see if you do the right things and, and think about the interpretation of your outcomes. What does it actually mean? And then these are the applications. You can, of course, apply LCA for a lot of things, but if you want the ISO standard, then you have to fit into this list. So you can use your LCA for a number of purposes. It's quite widely used, not just by uh, academia, but also by companies who want to uh, assess their own products and see yeah, where there are um, things that need to be improved or what 
could be the consequences if they shift to another way of, uh, of producing or other raw materials. And that is, of course, for us um, very relevant. Then about the goal and scope definition. One important part of that is, is the definition of the functional unit. So that if you do comparisons, that you um, compare things that are actually comparable. So equivalent products. This is um, yeah, what, what LCAs looked like in, in you know, 25 years ago. <coughs> Let's compare the, the plastic uh, cup with a china cup. And then yeah, when you start doing that, then you also start seeing that it's not so straightforward as that. For example, the, the china cup needs to be washed. Um, but on the other hand, the plastic cup, you, you use it only once and then you throw it away. While the china cup you can use many times. So all these things are important in the definition of your functional unit. Uh, <coughs> in this example, you can see that more clearly. Those are both, both yeah, means of transportation, the car and the train. But you cannot really compare a car to a train. <coughs> And therefore, you have to think of a functional unit in, in terms of functions and, and services. Like in this case, uh, one kilometer of transport. You can do that by car, but you can also do that by train. And then it's more comparable. And that is what you have to do whenever you um, uh, yeah, want to assess alternatives for your product. So in the case of the facades, you cannot just say, okay, I have facade A and I compare that with facade B because there may be things, other things to consider. For example, one material is heavier than another or one material lasts longer than another or one material has more need of, of uh, repair or maintenance than another. And all those things are important if you want to um, uh, think about alternatives. Um, so, um, furthermore, it's, it's, I think, relevant to, to um, uh, realize that LCA tries at least to prov provide a complete overview of the environmental impacts related to a functional unit. So, not just um, related to the materials in the product, but also related to electricity use, to transport, to um, energy used in production processes, to the use processes where sometimes energy is used as well, and to waste management. So that is, if you do it like that, you have a cradle to grave LCA, and that is what, what an LCA really is. In contrast, and that you see often when talking about materials, there's the cradle to gate variant of the LCA. There you specify the, the whole uh, life cycle until the moment that your material is produced. So you forget about the use phase, you forget about the waste phase, and then you have information on, on yeah, what environmental impacts are um, included in, in the uh, uh, supply chain up to that moment. So it's incomplete information, but it is still relevant information, especially if you think about changing um, materials. Here you see um, uh, an example of some cradle to gate uh, LCAs for specific materials. On the left hand side there are a number of metals. Um, steel, aluminium, copper, zinc, lead, nickel, manganese. Then some, some construction minerals here, concrete and brick. Then some bio-based materials, the cross-laminated timber, hardwood and, and bamboo. And finally, uh, one plastic, PVC. All those materials are used in construction. Um, and what you see in the graph here is the contribution of one kilogram of that material to the climate change problem. So you see that, that for metals, the score is, is usually much higher than for the other materials. It's because they are very energy intensive materials. A lot of energy is, is uh, taken up in the production of those materials. And you see that back in their CO2 score. 
um, there are some, some other things that you need to keep in mind um, uh, when defining the functional unit. So you cannot just use these data uh, one to one. Um, and that is uh, where I hand over, I think. Oh, I have still this one to go. Right. I think I'll skip that and go just go to um, uh, Teun's contribution. Um, some findings in general is that, that metals have a comparatively high score on L all impact categories and that bio-based materials are generally very good, so they score low, but they have score high on land use. Um, and for all materials where it's applicable, um, you see that secondary production, the so recycle, recycling, has lower impacts than primary production. However, not all materials can be recycled. For some, it's just downcycling and not more. Now, if you uh, think about how to reduce the environmental impacts related to buildings or facades in the buildings, then, well, these are sort of the options. Some of them, everybody includes under circular economy, some not. So you can use different materials, you can use less materials, recycled materials uh, related to products. You can <coughs> go for design for disassembly so that you can reuse parts of, of the whole product later on, or design for longevity, which means that your product can be, be kept in use for a much longer time. And then if you assess those options with LCA, in principle, you need to take the cradle-to-grave angle. And in principle, include all environmental impact categories with a defined functional unit. In practice, this is often difficult because the data are lacking or um, um, yeah, you're just thinking about um, the, the cradle-to-gate, the materials only. Now I would like to hand over to um, my colleague, Teun Verhagen. And he will take you through some examples. Yes. Thank you, Esther. Um, I am Teun Verhagen. I am a PhD student at Leiden University. And I'm going to uh, talk you through the exercise. Uh, we're looking at uh, environmental impact of facades. Um, one of the most used material in facades is uh, aluminium. Uh, it's lightweight, it's, cor it's corrosion resistant, and it looks good as well. And primary production of aluminium is very energy intensive. Uh, secondary production of aluminium is already less energy intensive, so its environmental impact in relative CO2 emissions per normalized functional unit of facade, uh, let's call it uh, CO2 emissions, is much lower already. And if we look at the industry, around 40% of um, the material in the production of aluminium is recycled content. And we're going to take that as a benchmark to compare the other materials in the exercise against today. For example, uh, a facade can also be made from steel. It has a lower environmental impact in a kilogram CO2 equivalent per kilogram of material, but it also has a higher density. So for the same product, um, you need more weight in steel than of aluminium. Uh, it's already been corrected in the figure, but you can see that even after that, the production of steel for a facade has a lower environmental impact than aluminium. But you should also take other considerations into account for a real LCA. So it's also less corrosion resistant, has possibly a shorter lifespan, and it also possibly needs more cleaning and maintenance. Another material option for facades are bio-based materials. Uh, bio-based materials such as uh, hardwood and cross-laminated timber has a lower environmental impact per kilogram than aluminium, like only a few percent of the impact of our benchmark of aluminium 40% recycled content, and also a much lower environmental impact than the primary produced steel. Um, we already accounted for the lower lifespan of bio-based uh, 
material facades as well in this figure. Um, again, here you need to take considerations into account that um, bio-based materials have a higher maintenance and repair, which also leads to increased environmental impact during its lifespan. And also, we don't know the influence on the thermal insulation of the building by using bio-based materials. But sewer two emissions are only one type of environmental impact. If we look at land use, uh, uh, in comparison with aluminium, the bio-based materials have a much higher impact category, around 23 to 80 times higher than aluminium. Uh, so for land use, aluminium is by far the better choice. So the opposite of the sewer 2 emission category. And we also looked at modular designed aluminium facades, um, in which we assumed that a modular designed aluminium facade has a longer lifespan than a normally designed facade. And uh, if, if we look at the figure, then we can see that uh, the modularly designed facade has a lower environmental impact than even the steel product, and uh, around 70% of the aluminium product. But also here, you need to take into account that it's a, probably a more complex product, which with possible increased maintenance and repair, leading to increased environmental impacts during its lifespan, possibly. And also, again, we don't know the influence of the thermal insulation of the building for this product. Um, Thank you for listening. I will give the floor back to my colleague, Esther. Can you put this on again? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, over to me again for the take home messages out of this whole exercise. A first take home message would be um, always keep in mind why do we want circularity or any op other option for that matter. There should be a purpose to it and you should always check whether it actually fulfills this purpose. And that is take home message too. Does it actually fulfill, well, what, oh, I see that I did not finish my <laughs> sentence there. I'm sorry. Um, for the final version of the, the slides, I will do that. Um, and does it actually fulfill? Um, a third message refers to life cycle assessment, the cradle to gate and the cradle to grave versions. Ideally, you would want to do the cradle to grave LCA, but then you have to think very carefully about your functional unit. What exactly is it going to be um, uh, to, in order to, to make your alternatives really comparable and then you have to take into account things like well the one is heavier than the other the one has a longer lifespan than the other uh, the one needs more um, repair or maintenance in the meantime than the other all these things are part of your product or of service system um, we also have seen that circularity um, can bring environmental benefits we saw that most clearly in the aluminium example where the recycled aluminium actually had much lower impacts than the primary aluminium. So here there's a clear benefit. But also things like um, um, modular design of a product so that you, can, you do not have to replace the whole product but you can take parts out of it and repair it thereby lengthening the lifespan can be a very effective option. Um, but it's not the only option. There are other options as well, as well if you uh, want to reduce uh, environmental impacts. For example, go to different materials like the bio-based materials. That is really something that, that, yeah, if you are trying to go for a better environmental performance, then you need to look outside of, of, of very narrowly defined concepts. Other things can as well. Take home message five, there are almost always side effects. And you saw that in the example of, of the greenhouse gas emissions versus the land use. While aluminium scores much worse than bio-based materials on greenhouse gas emission, it actually scores much better on land use. So then it depends on what do you think is important and what can be important in a certain context. 
So there are always side effects and you have to um, assess those as well. Um, and then finally, it's, it's quite complicated. You need to think of a lot and you need to collect a lot of data and, and find the right um, the way of combining them and, and thinking about, uh, well, what does it all mean? So it's quite complicated, but it can be done. Thank you very much for your attention. You think so? Better to have a chat than, than nothing. <laughs> um, what's interesting that we are in the environment of industrialist businessmen, practitioners, and um, the reason for them to adopt CE may not be in your slides, may not be in one of the three things that you mentioned early on, which is cost and benefit for us in terms of business, maybe. Maybe. In terms of what? In terms of cost and business. Cost for the business. Yeah, I did mention it. Oh, sorry. The very <laughs> first slide. <laughs> the slide. And then okay. I said, I'm not going into oh, that. No, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's quite true, obviously. Yeah, it can pr provide new business opportunities. And um, it can be a good thing from that point of view as well. It's, um, yeah... I mean, that was the topic of yesterday's lecture. <laughs> so, uh. No, that, that, that's not my point, actually. My, my point was, um, I was just wanted to share with you that um, the, the kind of questions that we've always been asked by the industrialist is that, what is it for us? They normally have pre two pressures. One is from their customers. So if their customers want it, then they will do it. Number two, if the government push them to do it, then they will do it. Without one of these two, they won't do it. That's what we... <laughs> well, then, so there has to be a push, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, that um, providing environmental information, yeah. for example, is something that, that companies now have to do. They cannot get away by, by not doing it and just having claims. They really have to, to include it in their environmental reporting. And... Um, yeah, the same for, for energy saving measures. That is also something but that there is a big push there. Um, the, s the same can happen for a circular economy or other types of improvements uh, uh, of the performance of the products. So, yeah, why not? And, and how the push actually would need to happen, whether it's legislation or whether it's... Um, education or whether it's uh, financial incentives well that those are all possibilities I would say thank you thank you very much <coughs> okay um, Esther, thank you very much just a question because Looking from the product developer standpoint, um, these are very essential things that you compare materials, products, all the elements in it. You know, how, how big is the effort to guide your product development, you know, towards a direction? Like, you know, you constantly have to recalibrate things from material use, uh, define your scenarios on which you compare. You know, can you somehow quantify, you know, what that, what that <laughs> will mean in terms of effort yeah. and cost to do that? Well, that, that's actually a very good question and the, and the answer is, of course, you can do a screening LCA in a few days and if you want to really, really do a very, very thorough, etc., then, then it takes you a year. But um, 
already in a few days you have some sensible insights. But isn't there any kind of rule of some tools that help you to really quickly oh, yeah, position no, and in yeah, the yeah, end yeah, make yeah. it, you know, yeah. you find your... Oh, no, yes. There's um, a commercial software available with databases in the back. And basically then you just have to push a button and you get an outcome. Um, but that, that is, well, obviously from an academic point of view that's less than uh, adequate because you don't know what happens then and why these results come out. So you, you have to know that as well. Yeah. So where are in the chain my, the, 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 yeah, the things that contribute most. But that can also be done by this commercial software. Only then it takes a little knowledge and it takes a little um, extra effort. But yeah, there are commercial uh, softwares that, that can help you big time with it and that provides all the background data so that you don't have to collect that yourself. Yeah, it just w would be interesting to, maybe not now, but to, to brainstorm and outside. If you go to the to work of a product developer and see what steps he does, you know, what, in which way could usefully guide him yeah. in a most effective way. I believe there is even a version, at least there used to be, that was used in the um, industrial design um, uh, uh, educational program. That is an LCA tool specifically for designers. Okay. So that exists as well. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was at COP last week. And the message at COP now is all about net zero. I'm just picking up your expertise in this area because I don't understand the, the detail of that. And it seems like on the one hand, you need to reduce the carbon. On the other hand, you need to capture the carbon. That's, that, that's all I understand. But do you think circular economy would move to circular net zero, for example? Because economy is all about reducing, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think it, it's can be an important um, uh, mechanism not to go to zero, but to go close to zero. Um, you will always need energy, and you will always need that to, to produce the materials. It's, um, I believe that materials are about 30% or so of the total uh, amount of, of energy used. It's really a lot. It's used to produce all these materials and products. And if you can reduce that, for example, by using secondary materials or by lengthening lifespans or by reusing products, etc., well, then that helps, obviously. But it doesn't bring you down to zero. For that, we really need to go to, um, yeah, to a different energy system, a different electricity system where fossil fuels are no longer used. Then, then you can get close, I think, if you do those two major transitions in one go, the circularity transition and the energy uh, transition. Thank you. So is everyone happy and wired? <laughs> That's good. Okay, I think there are just team members here at the floor, but in case someone else should listen to this, this is the, um, the third session, a uh, test session for our um, education program that we are developing called Facade Reverse Logistics. And here at the fair we had uh, trial lectures and this is basically the end result uh, where we're trying to get this all together to form a coherent course program, a course structure. Um, so the teaching format as we envision it now would be lectured followed by interactive working sessions on paper with sticky notes or on mirror board. Uh, Basically, the philosophy behind that is that uh, the industry, uh, the participants will have to develop their own products and it's a very individual task and we cannot do that for them. So, um, the canvas as a tool um, is there to develop new types of concept. Um, this will be the lecture structure, the structure of the course. So, um, I think after an introduction about uh, the project and about the raw materials kicks, of, of course, isn't it? I think it would be really good to start with um, a lecture about why. So the lecture Esther gave, in a way, that makes clear 
what is the basis of all this? No? Um, why should we do it? Why should we not do it? And especially liked you know, the, the, your last comments being critical about what you do and to understand. But basically to get people uh, enthusiastic. <clears throat> then there will be the part about circular building products, design engineering and technology, the business and supply chain models. And here uh, I'm looking at Benny. Yeah, of course, that will be uh, your part. And finally, life cycle cost analysis and evaluation <clears throat> of the course. And these are the three ingredients for the people to be able to work on their own facade or their own reverse logistics concepts. And in the end, there will be a summary and that will be done with our tool, with our teaching aid, the Canvas. Now again, I put some slides in, in case someone is here in the, in the room that hasn't heard about it. But basically, <clears throat> we have the classical forward logistics. Um, so it's a process of, um, yeah. And here, um, reverse logistics, basically to recover all the value. And so, sorry, I'm just moving on. So we have defined in the project a number of steps that was very much at the beginning. And these process steps are really important if you want to get a grip on the topic. So it starts with deconstruction, basically where you take the facade of the building or basically you dismantle your product. Uh, the collection of parts and pieces, we know that's a very important uh, um, step in the process. You have to transport them to a new facility eventually. And there it's about inspecting and sorting. So finding out what is the quality of the product, what type of materials are used. Um, and that will be very specific depending on what type of product we're actually looking at. In the, in the end, the real life option. So that's what we look at to give that material, that part, uh, a new um, meaning and a new role and basically retain the value it has. So also we talked about earlier about the bottlenecks um, that have been defined before, um, you know, so cost savings, a better reputation, revenue, uh, the pollution inspects, and so on. And on the uh, barriers, that's the, um, the lack of proper design, tight scheduling, uh, efforts, costs, and so on. And we want to shed a light on these opportunities and barriers because we think it's about every individual project that you encounter where you have to uh, evaluate those. So again, let's go to the life cycle stages. These are the classical stages. And if we talk about the products or building products, that's normally done even before the actual building process starts, before the architects get in that basically design the building. The most, let's say, uh, value is, is captured in products, which you can also can see here at the trade fair. And this is opted for, and they're integrated in the whole design and building process. And so that's done before, because that's a very important part, that the developing design process of project products has to be done uh, with a view on all these uh, classical phases. And that is, of course, the trick. How do you do that for uh, you know, a, a time of uh, 30 years? Now, you can also come to this model about circular economy, with basically trying to loop all these phases with the three aims, minimizing resource input, waste emission, water, and energy leakage. The avoid and, um, uh, it avoids disposal and loss of economic and ecological value, and it's about slowing, closing, and narrowing energy and material loops. And there are basically three, three strategic approaches to do that. One is smarter material product use and manufacture, so in the first life cycle phase. Then later on, it's about extending lifespan of components, buildings, and um, closing of the, the cycles. And then it's the end of life application of materials and components. And when we talk about reverse, yeah, well, design and development really is in the center of all that um, approach. Um, we can also you know, talk about the R strategies we're trying to locate roughly and attach them to the three strategies. And this is now, it's important for us where we think facade reverse logistic comes in. That's actually talking about <clears throat> this area. And these are, you know, the, the three 
the four um, phases we discovered, deconstruction, collection, inspection, sorting, and the real life option with the three aspects that we're working on. And this again has an effect <clears throat> on certain R strategies. You know, it's about remanufacturing of components, the reuse, <clears throat> like enable, enabling circular strategies. So I'm very interested what you guys think, if that's a model that we could uh, communicate huh, to the participants. So, so basically how to work and how to do it, and that's where we came up with the, the canvas idea. Um, where on one hand, you know, we have our three, let's say, fields of, of expertise. Here we have, um, here we have the four phases, and I think it would be very good to get get a grip on a complex topic by looking individually at the four phases. You know, with the aspects here, or, you know, of technology, um, you know, stakeholder processes, or the environmental impact. So basically, you could say. This is like how we do it. You know, this is the effects of doing it in terms of business processes, stakeholders. And this will be actually, what does it deliver? Does it have a positive impact? Huh? Um, that's it. And so our idea is that, that this could be a, a teaching aid. So basically, you're giving lectures and the, student, the students, you know, with a number of questions the students are helped and are triggered to give answers on that in a, in a sort of creative, playful process. And then in the end, you know, this will be a call for action, you know, so in the end, you know, in deconstruction. So what, if you have thought about this, what is it you're going to do? Which steps must be taken next to enable the real life option? You know, ending, ending at the end here. Yeah, with their individual experience about the project, the idea they have, and they say, okay, Next thing I have to do, you know, I have to do a better life cycle assessment. I have to talk to my boss. You know, we have to think, we have to, you know, measure or find out how big, uh, how many products will be returned. So that's basically it. So by having the, the map, uh, discuss with students, improve, and basically it's a designing process. And we, we believe that the students coming out, having this, this map, this is a way of teaching and learning and understanding this um, complex topic. Yeah. That's it. <laughs>